So moving on to the next session, which looks at the great talent crunch through the lens of two investors, a very interesting conversation. Oliver Ripple and partners set up Asia Capital to help Southeast Asian entrepreneurs build a new generation of unicorns, while Chris Hameter is the co-founder of Thea Ventures, which is an early stage venture capital firm with a strategic focus on the travel and transportation industry. Now, these two investors have one thing in common, they are betting big on the next generation hospitality companies. Let's find out why and how they view the talent crunch. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver and Chris for joining us and Pete for being my co-captain in this discussion. So given this is the bridge series, you know, I found this slide by Asia Partners interesting in its comparison between Southeast Asia and the US. So Oliver from Asia Partners, what was the key message you wanted to convey with this comparison? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for, for having me uh, uh, again. And it's always a pleasure to, um, to engage with you on, on, uh, on these uh, you know, wonderful discussions on, on Southeast Asia and what's happening in the region. So um, what, what we try to portray is that actually Southeast Asia has, has a lot of potential. Uh, and potential always starts, uh, you know, from the from the macro perspective, right? And um, th there is no better way to describe the macro than to look at um, the the monthly active humans <laughs> that you have, you know, in a in a in a certain region or 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 in a certain country. So um, undoubtedly, Southeast Asia uh, has, you know, close to um, close to ten percent of humanity, right? So that's what you see on the right hand side of the column. Um, but what we also felt was what was interesting that. If you compare Southeast Asia, uh, you know, to the to the U.S., that um, despite you know, Southeast Asia being you know, so much almost double uh, in terms of uh, in terms of population, uh, if you just look at um, the the top cities, um, fairly comparable to uh, to the United States. So so from that perspective, um, you know, we we actually have even 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 higher potential uh, in the future, right, for for further urbanization. Uh, which comes with all kinds of, you know, opportunities within certain product and services and also tech-enabled product and services that, that come with it. Right. So clearly, you know, Asia Partners was set up on the belief of this massive potential that you see, you know, in this comparison that you've given. And it's also set up on the belief of Southeast Asia's golden age. You call it the golden age. And you've predicted that there will be 20 plus more billion dollar uh, value tech companies from the region by 2029. That's your prediction. Given what's happened the last two years, do you still hold on to that belief, Oliver? Yeah, this is an interesting one. We actually got this one wrong, um, but um, <laughs> differently wrong, right? So, so, so we thought there, there, there's, a, there's an opportunity for uh, multi-billion dollar plus companies uh, in technology in the region to go from, so like roughly, um, you know, 15 to, to 35, so an increase um, of 20, um, you know, within sort of like a decade. So what we've seen in the past two years alone uh, was actually an increase of 24 uh, additional companies. So, so uh, you know, th that, that number already has, has, has blown way past that, um, that, that decade um, target that we had um, previously. And again, we, we believe that um, it's, it's due to this, um, this golden age fact, right, that Southeast Asia has hit just the right uh, zone of affluence uh, about a decade behind China, uh, a decade uh, ahead of India. Uh, and even more importantly, we are seeing now uh, lots of interesting talent, lots of interesting entrepreneurs um, having access to funding, having access to overall um, uh, you know, uh, you know, further talent ecosystems, having the playbooks from, from China and from other parts of the world, um, and, and, and really developing interesting businesses uh, across uh, the region, not only single country focused but uh, but multi country focused so so in a way um okay. the, the entrepreneurs well, have surprised us they 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 have done this faster than we anticipated okay pete great yes let's uh let's bring chris into this conversation so chris as you uh reflect back on on your original investment thesis at at their ventures it was always based around travel growing faster than gdp and in addition to that travel being very underinvested in in technology and if if you can pull up the slide jerry you were dead right for the decade um, between 2010 and 2019 
Um, so this is some focus right research that shows the industry growing from uh, just over a trillion dollars in 2010 to just under 1.5 trillion in 2019. And from a GDP perspective, we went from about nine and a half percent to 10 and a half percent over the decade, as far as travel being a percentage of, of GDP. But then came 2020. So um, has has your investment strategy changed at all uh, in the past couple of years, or are you still just doubling down on your original thesis? Um, you know, we're doubling down on our original thesis um, for sure. I think that if anything, we've accelerated our deployment and we've certainly increased uh, our enthusiasm. I think if you were able to take this slide and and move it left and show the forecast for the next seven to 10 years, it, you know, you're looking at a multi-trillion dollar complex global value chain that's likely to enjoy 15 to 20 percent compounded annual growth as it recovers, made up by a collection of massive incumbents who found themselves largely caught flat footed and lacking agility when the pandemic hit. So suddenly, you know, we've gone from this world that was always historically resistant to the adoption of, of, of technology and change to a world that is just absolutely uh, fundamentally focused on tech as a must have, uh, no longer just a nice to have. So, you know, frankly, the, the pandemic has accelerated the pace of innovation and it certainly has brought in more investment and enthusiasm uh, in, in companies that are, that are showing that they've, they've figured out the next thing. Right, you know, that leads us nicely to the next question because I'm gonna ask Oliver, right? Given that COVID has accelerated tech everywhere, right? And in Southeast Asia, you said by 10 years, I, what are you more concerned at this stage to feel that growth? Is it capital scarcity or is it talent scarcity? What are you most, most concerned about? Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. And uh, you have to dig a bit deeper because uh, you can be very happy with, with progress on both. Um, but in certain areas, you, you still have some catching up to do. So if you talk about uh, you know, capital scarcity, um, what's undoubtedly um, positive in the region is that, that we have now, uh, and this is you know, thanks to you know, a great you know, venture capital ecosystem, we have now actually enough capital at the early, early stages of, of capital formation. So if you are an entrepreneur, you're looking for like, so like your Series A, Series B type of funding, the, the you know one five ten million dollar check to get your get your company you know going um, usually at that point um, to to demonstrate product market fit um, to 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 really expand into for example one territory um, you know there is capital there um, and that hasn't been the case ten years ago so so that's a that's a great development um, also if you are a, a company that is already very well established um, maybe thinking about uh, you know a near term IPO um, at that late stage um, of, uh, of of private equity, there's 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 also sufficient capital, and that can be you know, local, regional capital, capital from overseas. Um, so once you have demonstrated strong proof points, um, then then you know you you usually also are fine. Uh, where there's still okay. scarcity from a capital perspective is in that middle zone. So um, if you are an entrepreneur, you want to raise thirty million dollars, you want to with that thirty million dollars go from maybe um, one or two markets to you know three to six markets in the region. Um, et cetera, and you may not be um, one to two years away from an IPO, but more like you know, three to five years away from an IPO, um, there's still uh, a scarcity. So we quantify this as about 1.1 billion uh, of growth equity at that 20 to $100 million check size range that's missing each year in Southeast Asia, if you were to compare it to China and GDP adjusted. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's a concern and uh, uh, Asia partners and other you know, growth equity investors are trying to fill that. On the talent side, we've also come a long way. So um, where uh, previously, for example, tech talent was, uh, was fairly concentrated in, let's say, Singapore and Vietnam. Uh, we've seen, especially Indonesia, uh, come through quite nicely in the, in the past uh, year or two, um, you know, surpassing, for example, Singapore uh, in terms of, sort of like that raw um, you know, engin engineering talent. Um, but there's still pockets where, where talent is scarce. Um, and that could be very specialized functions, like a like a, like a head of sales um, or a chief product officer or a chief people officer or that CFO that can ultimately take you right. 
public. So, so yeah. Oliver, we'll, we'll get into the talent scarcity specifically yeah. uh, later, you know, uh, but let's let's focus on hospitality. And I think, uh, Pete, you, you have a question to ask of Chris specific to yeah. hospitality, right? Yeah. So, so, um, so as, as we think about the great talent crunch, which is what we're talking about today, um, obviously hospitality has been one of the, the segments that's been hit the hardest. So does this support your conviction, Chris, in the value of, of lodging tech, or are we stretching below that critical thresh, threshold of, of just not, not having enough staff? Uh, both. I mean, from a yeah. perspective of a hospitality delivery, we are, we are definitely below that threshold of delivering um, service again. I mean, you know, those of us that have been on the road, I, I mean, we see it day in and day out, right? The restaurants are closed, the you know, services are shut down, guests are frustrated, especially in the accommodations world. And, you know, it's going to take some time to get to get people back to work. But, you know, that said, I think that the that the great crunch of labor in uh, in hospitality generally is part of the problem um, that the industry ran into when the pandemic hit and found itself lacking productivity. And I think a huge push for tech innovations and even business model innovations is coming from this this really desperate need to sort of rejigger the model so it's less dependent uh, on labor at least in yeah. non guest facing labor. Yeah, and, and, and from a more practical front, um, so companies like Opti in, in your portfolio, are, are they finding it more difficult to sell into hotel groups because there's just been such a reorganization of, of responsibility? Um, obviously a tech platform that helps optimize operations, but is it more challenging from the sales front to get into the hotels? You know, it's actually the opposite. You know, I found that at least at, at the larger groups pre-pandemic, there was a lot of sort of stagnation by committee, right? A lot of these large organizations had global cross-functional teams evaluating software technology for housekeeping and, you know, were on track to deliver their recommendations in two years. <laughs> right? so that's not exactly what we would consider agility. So those teams got decimated by COVID. Furloughed, organizations got flattened, people got moved aside. And there has been more of a, um, a willingness to, to iterate and experiment and test. And that has enabled good software companies to get a bite at the apple. And if they're delivering ROI and they can show it, um, there's sort of an eager uh, uh, you know, um, uh, enthusiasm to share it among their peers and, and these companies grow. So it's, a, it's actually a really good time to be a productivity driven software business in the hospitality and travel space. Yeah, I think we're seeing the same trend in Southeast Asia for sure, right, Oliver? You know, it's similar trend. Uh, also facing labor crunch in, in in places like Singapore. Now you invested in Red Doors, uh, which which has done remarkably well through through the pandemic. Now, what tech trends are you most excited about? You know, in how it will transform hospitality from a labor and service standpoint. Yeah, so uh, you have a very good point. So. I mean, what we are excited about, and that that was, you know, a strong reason why we invested uh, in, in Red Cross in the first place. It's it's kind of like a new age. We call it like a new age hospitality company. So it's a uh, it's it's asset light. Um, so it doesn't have to run um, hotels uh, themselves. Um, you know, you don't have to um, incur rental and, uh, and 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 labor costs right at the at the property level. Uh, but they're very good in 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 building brands and generating demand. So you going into this um, sort of like franchise slash partnership model, uh, you know, with uh, with hotel partners, um, where you are helping them to to increase and optimize, you know, revenue and profitability, um, and you're going into this, um, you know, very entrenched, um, uh, you know, you know, partnerships, uh, you know, with them. And um, so it's it's almost like if you take a step back, it's it's like a software as a service plus marketplace, you know, type of type of model. Um, so you're not only providing technology, but you're also uh, helping the hotel leverage their technology to to optimize um, uh, a, a demand and, and and ultimately revenue and profit generation. So we find that interesting. It's not sort of like just a naked you know solution, um, just just digitizing for the sake of digitizing. It's actually saying like, hey, we can do better um, and we can do things more efficiently at the same time. Okay. So Chris, um, 
we had Chris Nassetta, uh, Hilton CEO, on uh, on on one of our our virtual meetings last year, and he suggested that labor is probably his single biggest issue, and it's forcing some operational model changes um, that's you know creating a a higher margin business for him. So, is this just public? CEO speak, or or do you see these operational models changing? And Oliver touched on it a little bit with Red Doors, and and you've got some some portfolio businesses that are doing similar. So, is there truly a an operational shift that's happened? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a really important point and a good question. And by the way, I love Red Doors. We 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 know those guys. I've been to Jakarta and met with the team. You know, we almost participated in in the last financing, but it would in. We'll find a way to work together, Oliver, because that's a great company. The um, no, no, I think Chris is absolutely right. Chris is spot on. Part of the problem in our industry is is inertia, right? And and through 2019, the the hospitality delivery model hasn't changed much since the 1950s. Let's face it, the back office is full of people doing sort of nonsensical things like night audits and on-site accounting and you know but no one has bothered to change that because RevPAR has been growing successfully at a pace that's outpaced the growth in in labor cost so the model hasn't changed now we're suddenly so disrupted by all of these you know changes and forces that the model has to change otherwise the the, the big elephant in the room which by the way are the people that own the real estate are going are going to start kicking out management companies left, right, and center, and trying to figure out how to do it themselves. Because at some point, you know, they have to monetize their real estate. So what I think this is doing is it's enabling a completely new think about what is the delivery of hospitality. And what we've been saying for years is that you know accommodations where people sleep when they're not at home is this big amorphous cloud, ranging from you know, the early days of Airbnb and sleeping on someone's couch all the way to the Marriott Marquis in downtown uh, Washington, D.C., and a range of things in between that. And we're seeing innovations like Sonder, who are delivering sort of professionalized, branded, short-term rental experiences to companies like Lifehouse, who have really used a, a complete vertical technology stack to rethink the delivery of hospitality in the small hotel real estate form factor in ways that can triple NOI just by removing labor that's non-guest facing. Um, and, you know, and, and you, so you see these models and frankly, I think for the big brands, the opportunity for them to rethink the way they deliver hospitality to take out some of that labor overhead will result in greater margin and greater delivery to the real estate owners in the end of the day because frankly, I think travelers are coming back and they're coming back with a, you know, with a force, certainly leisure travelers. And, you know, as long as they still have the same experience and perceived value, I think we will see RevPAR growing again to record levels. Right. So, you know, it's, it's really a rebound and recovery and the convergence of tech and then, you know, talent issues facing, uh, I mean, forcing tech innovation, right? So Oliver, I mean, getting back to what we're talking about the talent issue, right? So in your 2022 rebound and recovery report, which I found fascinating, a lot of data, you shared some data on the Southeast Asia chessboard, right? And that looks at relevant technical talent. So which markets will face the biggest challenge you think accessing the relevant technical talent to fuel growth in Southeast Asia? Yeah, so... Uh... I think the, the 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 chessboard says it all, right? So so we had um, we have good technical talent in places like Singapore, Vietnam, and now also increasing the Indonesia, which wasn't always the case. So that's that's a that's a great um, that's a great development. Um, and uh, and the other markets still have some some catching up to do. Um, and what has happened is that that a lot of companies that are focusing on Southeast Asia, they were often supplementing technical talent from within the region with technical talent from from India, uh, you know, China, uh, you know, elsewhere. Um, so so that, that that is so so the companies are are creative around going around that uh, that, that 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 issue on the technical talent. Um, right. Overall, the, the the trajectory is positive, uh, but we still have some catching up to do, especially if you compare Southeast Asia to, for example, China uh, or, or India. Well, especially, I guess, during COVID, I mean, where everybody's working remote and now we're talking about hybrid workplaces, the ability to hire from anywhere. So even though Singapore is like a commercial capital, 
you know, companies here now have access to talent everywhere, you know, including including the the US, right? Uh, I mean, Pete, that's uh, that's your next question for, for it's Chris. A, it is. Yeah. It's a good point. And and um, you know, here in the West, there, there's definitely a big developer, um, uh, you know, a, 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 def, a deficiency in in developer talent, and it's. I suppose dubbed the great developer drought is what I've heard it call. And companies like Amazon Web Services and Google are offering massive salaries and signing bonuses and benefits. Um, so, Chris, how have you been supporting your por portfolio on the talent front? And what types of strategies are they putting into place to recruit and, and ret retain talent? Well, I mean, I think that the you know, first of all, we're, we're seeing, of course, more and more and more um, offshore development talent being incorporated permanently into teams. And I, I think we've now gotten to a place where that's seamless, right, and very effective, and it works well. Um, I also think, look, Google and Facebook can pay all they all, you know, as much as they want to. It ain't a startup. Startup environments are different and they're fun and they're dynamic and there's equity involved, which is, you know, people like skin in the game. And so good startups with velocity still manage to attract talent. Uh, and, and frankly, it's, it's, the, it's the fundamental job of the CEO to onboard that talent and build his or her team over time. Um, so, you know, we do what we can to support, but in the end of the day, that is a fundamental job of the founder. Right. And Oliver, do you think in Southeast Asia, you know, where we have a younger workforce, uh, you know, and tech is relatively new, right? You know, and do you feel that talent here still wants to gravitate towards the companies like Facebook or Google, you know, or, or the TikToks versus working for a startup, which is really, really hard grinding work? Yeah. Good, good, good point. Um, so a few years ago, that clearly there was a strong, um, um, you know, gravitational pull to these more established, um, you know, global brands. Um, but we have had some good success more recently of um, of local and regional role model companies that went all the way to to become public companies and uh, to uh, to to really put Southeast Asia on the map. I mean, C is a good example. Uh, but also more recently companies like Bukalapak and Grab and, and hopefully more to come. Um, so that actually has made it um, easier to see yourself becoming part of sort of like a, an emerging startup ecosystem that not sort of like just uh, not, not going to go anywhere, but going to go all the way right? to become ultimately yeah. a public company ringing that bell right on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so we definitely see... Um, you know all the all the all the reasons that 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 Chris mentioned, right? In terms of uh, you know working on, on on cutting edge stuff, having having real ownership, um, and and making making sort of like difference in terms of your line of, line of sight activity, where um, where where people are are shifting more towards the the, the more startup ish kind of like ecosystem, um, um, you know, away from the more established players. Right. So let's go to the next slide, which really shows how Singapore, you know, is the commercial capital of Asia, but you know, from the from the standpoint of regional executive roles, but then now with the ability to really hire from anywhere, I think you know startups really now have the uh, luxury, you know, and the ability, as as we were saying, to just hire from anywhere. Kind of kind of levels the the playing field a, a, a little bit, you know. And so now, uh, Pete, why don't we let's shift to investment strategies now and talk about you know talk about what's happening with their funds and what they're doing. Yeah. So, Chris, you you uh, for, for years, um, Fair was primarily focused on seed stage and and Series A, and then you you jumped a little bit later stage and and were were involved in the SPAC game uh, in 2021 and brought Inspirado public last year, which has bucked the trend of underperforming returns for companies using this instrument to access the public markets. Um, so, I, I've got. I've got three questions for you. First off, why the shift from later stage or into later stage? Second, what's your secret? And third, will you launch any more <laughs> SPACs or is the SPAC craze cooled, cooled for good? <laughs> Great question. So, you know, I mean, look, first of all, you, you have to remember that we are a sector focused investment platform, right? Fair Ventures is 
focused exclusively on travel tech and mobility. And so, you know, within that sector, we, you know, we are more flexible with respect to stage. And we've done some later stage investing in the category. Now, during the pandemic, it became very clear to us that the, the, the disruption that our industry was facing would create an opportunity for those large private companies that had seen some resilience through the pandemic and had strong tailwinds coming out of it to get on the offensive, right? To take advantage of the moment and, and get out there and win. So we looked at a variety of ways to play that thesis and we decided to do it via a SPAC principally because we felt it was a, a, a vehicle to get companies to the public markets, to access capital, to lower their overall cost of capital, and again, get on the offense. We always approached it as a financing event, not a liquidity event. We always approached it as a long-term relationship with the company that we decided to merge with and as fundamental you know, operators within the sector that we focus. So our, our board came from the industry, our DNA is the industry. We, we felt that that differentiated us from many of the sort of transaction oriented SPACs that were out there. Um, and it helped us, you know, by having a deep focus in this industry, I think we had a fundamental sense of, of who was playing um, the right music. And we, we found Inspirato and we loved it, right? This is a luxury uh, traveler, which is a very interesting category, super powerful and resilient. It's sort of a supply side driven story. It's got this velvet rope subscription uh, process that, you know, you, you have to be inside the velvet rope in order to have access to the supply. So it, it kind of has this fundamental flywheel effect, which gives it a competitive advantage globally. So, you know, all the fundamental things were there. Um, and, you know, we just, uh, we just supported what we knew would work and have stayed with it. You know, the markets have responded very positively, although it is early days. I mean, you know, float is still thin and there's a lot of other, you know, reasons fundamentally why the stock may be as, as up or not, but, but still fundamentally, I, I'm a huge long-term and solid believer in the company. Um, so I would say from a secret sauce perspective, I would say anybody in the game of playing you know, with, with companies and, and, and investing, even in, in the world of SPACs is you, you kind of have to have a sense for, you know, your, your investing thesis. You just can't be out there looking for a transaction. And, and unfortunately, I think because SPACs became so hot, a lot of teams onboarded and established SPACs simply looking for a transaction. And they really didn't care if it was, you know, a, a pharma company or a transportation company. They just wanted to try to find a company to take public and make money. That's going to turn out to be a failed strategy. Those companies that have been specific and operator centric, I think will succeed. Now, the, the SPAC market is under a ton of pressure, but I don't think it's dead forever. In fact, I really do think that the that as a path to public, it, it's a good one for some companies, not for all. And as this sort of period shakes out, I think you will see the serial issuers come again, do more deals, and it'll become an alternative to a traditional IPO. Look, the traditional path to IPO is still, it's slow, it's opaque, you know, it, it just doesn't work fundamentally for every company that has an opportunity to get to the public market. So um, we intend to, to, you know, stay around the hoop and continue to do good work there. Right. So clearly, Chris has very, very strong views on the spec space, and I'm sure Oliver has too. But I want to focus, Oliver, on your fund, which is uh, you are in online video at tech, car marketplace and online travel, as well as online health, right? That, those are the areas that you stated in your report. Any further appetite for travel as it recovers? And if you, you know, listen to Chris, how passionate he is about specific travel uh, investments what's your appetite for travel right now as it recovers so we we have we have huge appetite for travel and we a lot of that appetite uh, can be can be fulfilled through our red rose investment right which uh, was was the first investment that we did uh, you know through 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 asia partners and we think that um, there's this tremendous opportunity right from a further regional expansion as well as um, also you know, thinking about you know further 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 brands in the market um, that uh, that you know where Red Rose can offer the same sort of like you know software plus marketplace slash demand generation you know type of service. Um, but having said that, um, you know travel is is one of the large 
subsectors uh, of tech and tech enabled businesses and uh, you know budget hospitality is just just one of those um, those use cases within with within travel so so ultimately we uh, we are open we at any given time we look at 20 to 30 subsectors um, of of tech within within southeast asia where there is a strong southeast asia anchoring and if we see interesting companies uh, you know go through the ranks and um, uh, are in this interesting middle zone of um, uh, too 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 large for venture capital too small for 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 late stage pe um, then as a growth equity focused investor uh, we would be looking at those companies so so uh, we fully agree that um, that 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 travel rebound uh, is is going to happen strongly uh, in the region um, that um, the the use cases which right now during the pandemic were mainly around domestic uh, uh, travel use cases um, will further again uh, be be strongly complemented by 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 inbound use cases which were uh, you know a bit um, a bit um, uh, you know less 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 of a, a focus during during the pandemic but uh, you know markets like um, like um, like like Thailand like Vietnam. Like Philippines, like Indonesia, we're going to shine again from an inbound perspective, right? So there's no no doubt about it in our minds. Mm -hmm. So now now uh, is, is both of your chances to make one prediction. So I'm going to phrase the question this way: What will be the largest opportunity that we will look back upon ten years from now and say, "Wow, the pandemic provided fertile ground for X"? Chris, let's start with you. Uh. uh it fertile ground for the total restructuring and rethink of accommodations real estate. I think that the old days of thinking about accommodations real estate as a hotel model only are over. I think multifamily is becoming a hybrid asset class. And I think that there will be more, including uh, you know, single family homes and luxury villas. I think the whole world of sort of hospitality real estate and the monetization of hospitality real estate is going to be the biggest fundamental shift happening pre-pandemic, but accelerated by the pandemic. Oliver, how about you? I think um, this this whole trend of um, becoming more of, 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 of nomads, right? Digital nomads, et cetera, um, uh, and to, 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 to basically move away from, from, from short-term travel to sort of like um, um, uh, travel that will um, require me to almost like um, relocate temporarily to, uh, to a new location. I think this is going to be huge, right? So we see this already with our entrepreneurs, um, you know, that, that the ones that we are backing at, at Asia Partners, right? That um, it's, it's much less about, uh, you know, going in and out of countries, uh, like doing the usual kind of like uh, triple axle of, uh, of of hitting three three countries within 24 hours it's much more to be co-located with the team on the ground for sometimes weeks or, 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 or even months right and to become part of that fabric and what that means in terms of um, the the accommodation uh, space what that means in terms of like how to organize and structure my travel where to stay um, what kind of services I need while I'm almost like becoming a resident for that few weeks or months uh, in that in that other right. location. I think we have barely scratched the surface uh, on that in, one. So that's we think we can, uh, be much more so, prevalent there. Yeah. So Pete, if I could answer the question and wrap up the session, I think that the pandemic provided fertile ground for collaboration. So between wit and focus, right, as we've seen, and I think we're going to see collaboration between Thayer Ventures and Capital uh, Asia Partners. And yes. they're going to collaborate before they come to with Singapore, October 3rd to 5th, and have the F1 weekend uh, before that. Uh, and it will provide fertile ground for a different way of traveling for our customers and for ourselves. So very exciting future, uh, you know, and how to turn this great talent crunch, right, you know, into the great renewal for our industry. So thank you so much, uh, Chris and Oliver, for joining, and Pete for being my co-captain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.